Flipping is not the end game. Flipping's not the end game. What's the problem with flipping? Yeah, you gotta keep doing it, he said. Here's what I say about flipping. Every deal I do, I'm out of business. Because why? If I wanna make more money, what do I have to do? Another deal and another deal. Now, hopefully you can create some systems and processes and you can build a real business and you've got team and things like that so that you can repeat the process. But it's transactional, isn't it? Okay, now I love the game. It's really fun. I'm excited about it. I'm, I wanna be active in it so it works. But flipping is not the end game. In fact, I don't think operating any type of deal is the end game. And if you think about it, I've thought about this a lot, you know, what does it take to do real estate? Like what is the circle of life in real estate? There's really three different people that have to be in a transaction. There's the finders. And these are the people that bring the inventory to market, right? These would be agents maybe, these would be wholesalers. And their job is what? They go out and they find the distressed property or they find the deal to find the opportunity and they bring that to market. Now, who buys those deals? Operators. These are investors that buy the property, they own the property, they fix it up and flip it or they keep it as a rental, but they're the ones that are now taking those properties and doing something with them. And then who's the third person in the cog here? The lender, right? So you have to have the capital then to do those deals. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Who is the top of the food chain? The lender is the top of the food chain. Okay, now why would you think that? The smartest person in the room is the lender, not the finder, not the operator. Does the lender get the call in the middle of the night when the toilet backs up? Does the lender get that call? They don't get that call, do they? Okay, my end game and what I'm gonna to propose to you as well is the end game is to become the lender in real estate. The lender is really the only truly passive income model. If becoming the lender is the end game, that's my end game, if that's the end game, how do we get there? A private money lender actively lends their money. And when I say actively lends their money, what does that mean? They're not giving it to somebody like a mutual fund and saying, go invest my money and you know, let me know how it goes. A private money lender is active in where they lend their money, meaning they learn how to underwrite. They are making conscious decisions about where their money's going on deals. They want a higher return. That's why they're lending it. Most of my private money lenders on my deals are getting double digits. They're getting 10, 12% or more on deals. And the one thing about a private money lender is they don't want to be the operator. They don't want to, or they don't have the time to be an operator, so they be the lender. Now, if we do a comparison here, like let's think about a side-by-side -side comparison. What's different about the operator and the lender? Well, the operator is leveraging their time and their expertise in order to make money. And what's unique about the lender? What is the lender doing? They're leveraging the money to make money. Isn't that cool? That's why the lender's at the top of the food chain, because it's their money that's making money, not their time and expertise that's making the money, which is also why it's truly passive. This is something that I teach my kids. I say, those who don't understand interest, how interest works, pay it. Those that do understand how interest works, what? Earn it. If you truly understand how interest works, then you wanna be on the earning side of that, not the paying side of that. So what are some of the benefits of becoming a private money lender? Well, like I said, no management, no maintenance, no contractors, no marketing, no, te no tenants. It's truly passive. I've got a friend who is a mentor for me and he has a $25 million fund. It's his money. So it's not like he pooled it and then he lends it out and makes a markup, right? It's his own money after tax cash. It's 25 million and he lends it out to a handful of investors. I'm one of them. He's in Arizona. He just lends in his market. Really cool guy. Uh, 25 million. His average return, his ROI is about 16%. He charges 12% and a couple points, and he typically lends the money twice a year. So his return on investment on his 25 million is 16%, which is how much annually? 4 million is a 16% return on 25 million. Now he has one admin 
and he's very hands-on, meaning he likes to know the asset. One guy, one admin runs this business doing private money lending. He'll show up at my projects in his Harley just to get out and look around. Super chill. $4 million a year, private money lending. Who thinks that's cool? I mean, the most work he does is he's got to walk out to the mailbox, you know, get his checks. Then he's got to go to the bank and deposit them, you know. That's passive. Who would agree with me that's passive income? So what I want to do now is I want to spend the rest of the time here talking about what it looks like to become a private money lender. How do we do this in the right way? And how do we do this in a safe way? What does it look like to do this? Well, there are two fundamental principles that we have to understand right out of the gate here. You only lend on good deals and you only lend to successful operators. If you do those two things, and we'll define what that might look like, but if you do those two things, you'll be safe. Now, my friend told me he's never taken back a property. And why do you think he can say that? These two things. He says, I don't lend on bad deals, so I understand the asset I'm lending on, and I only lend to successful operators. Okay, so let's deep dive this a little bit more. What makes it safe to lend money on real estate? You have to understand security. If you hold a security interest, then you are entitled to seize the asset, sell it, to be made whole on the loan. A secured loan is that in the event of a default, you can take back the asset that was pledged as collateral. And this is why this right here, this slide right here is why real estate is the greatest investment of all time. Why? Because it's a hard asset. We invest in the stock market and what happens? Poof, it's gone tomorrow because there is no hard asset. That's why real estate is so attractive to people. What's the difference between private money lending and hard money lending or asset-based lending? What's the difference? Sort of, you're on the right track, individual versus company. A hard money lender is a fund where they pooled money and now they're re-lending that money to you and me. Now, to become a hard money lender where I take your money and re-lend it out to you, who's involved now? Massive regulation, the SEC, you gotta be licensed, you gotta follow all these rules, you do that wrong and you go to jail. Like it's a big deal because I can't take your money and lend it to him without all the, following all the right processes. But can Jason do a personal loan to me on real estate? If it's his money, he can lend it to me and we don't need anybody's permission to do that. Okay, so private money lending is your money, it's one-to-one, -one. it's your money to somebody else's deal. And you can do that all day long. So what I'm talking about here is you transact your own after-tax dollars that you re-lend out as your end game. Now, understanding security and a secured loan is how you stay safe in your deals. It's how you lend smart. These are the two most important docs. Everybody here that is on the receiving end of this should understand these two. But what's the difference between a promissory note and the mortgage or deed of trust, depending on what state you're in? Most people don't know the difference. The prom note is just the terms of your loan. It's this amount, this interest, this due date, here's what happens if you don't pay it back. That's a note. And you and I can have a note. I can lend you $50,000. We've put together a promissory note and that's that. The mortgage or deed of trust, depending on your state, that's pledging the property as collateral to the loan, to the promissory note. And that gets recorded, which now becomes a lien on the property. What makes this special is that mortgage or deed of trust. Because like I said, now you have a hard asset. So if they default, what do you do? Take back the asset and be made whole. So when we talk about lending on good assets, let's go back to that. Remember rule number one, you have to lend on good assets. Well, what makes a good asset? First of all, there has to be a clear exit. If you don't understand the exit, like how am I getting paid back? Then that's a no-go. Number one question is how do I get my money back? Because we understand security and protection through the security, equity becomes the number one thing that we look at. Because if there's equity in the property or enough equity in the property, in the event of a default, we wanna make sure that we can fire sale the property and get what? All of our money back. With a hard money lender, they're so smart about how they lend that worst case you pay them back, best case what? You default and they take your asset. Why is that better for a hard money lender? Because they know that that asset has value, they're lending at a low enough loan to value, high enough equity position, that they'll make more money if they take the asset away from you because they'll resell it and make more money. 
because they keep all the upside when they take it away from you. Everybody see that? Imagine lending money and worst case they pay you back, best case you get the asset. <laughs> Who thinks that's a pretty good business model? So you have to identify, if you're a PML, you have to identify, okay, I'm looking at this asset, possibly gonna lend on this. Do I understand the exit? And do I understand my equity position in this asset? Meaning I'm gonna lend X amount, I'm gonna have a lean position. In the event of a default, can I be made whole easily with room to spare? Okay, so what about an operator? I actually think the operator is more important than the asset. Why? You could have the best asset in the world, but if the operator screws it up royally, <laughs> then you're back to square one, right? Most PML lenders that I work with, they're more interested in me than they are in the asset for that very reason. They wanna know, can I feel good about this operator? Do they know what they're doing? Do they have a plan? Can they execute? Am I gonna get my money back because this operator can see it to the finish line? There's two different ways that you could be a private money lender. You could be a debt lender or an equity lender. So let's talk about a debt lender. A debt lender just means that you hold a fixed rate of return. You get paid first. So when the asset gets sold, who gets paid first? The debt lender does before the operator. So the operator gets what's left after the debt lender gets paid back. So that means they get paid first. And there's no share in profit. You just get your rate of return that you agreed on. Whereas an equity lender, how are they different? They're actually a partner in the deal and they're gonna share in the profit and what else might they share in? The losses, yep. Thinking about this debt lender, they're gonna have a lean position. They wanna have a strong loan to value. That's that equity that they need to have in the deal. They're gonna want skin in the game. They're gonna want a clear exit. And a debt lender has little to no control. Who has a bank loan? Anybody have a bank loan on, on, on an asset? Does the bank call you up and say, you know what, I know you're thinking about painting your bedroom, aqua blue, I just don't like that color. Does the bank do that? No, they have zero control over what you do with the asset. And they like that, that's the whole reason why it's passive. Now, an equity lender, you're not gonna make that equity lender any payments. Now who thinks, if you're the, on the operator side, who thinks that's nice? No debt service, I love that. That's fantastic when you don't have to make a monthly payment while you're doing the asset. They typically want a higher return than 12% or whatever. They're gonna to wanna to cut in the profit. Now it could be 50-50, it could be 75-25. You have to decide what that split looks like. They understand that for the higher reward, the possible upside by being an equity lender, they also understand that there's possible risk because if it doesn't work out according to plan and there's a loss, they participate in that loss as well. And most equity lenders want a certain level of control. Now with my equity partners and lenders and my deals, this is something that I try to really get my head around and really make sure we have clear communication. Because I've had equity lenders that now wanna be involved in day-to-day -day operations and it's a complete nightmare. So I want them more on the passive side, but I can't really tell an equity lender that they can't be involved in the process, why? because I've agreed to partner with them in essence on the deal. So you wanna have really good communication about what that involvement looks like upfront, communicate that well. If you're the lender, you need to decide, okay, how involved do I wanna be in this project? Do I wanna be actively involved in the decision-making or do I wanna let that operator do their thing and get a monthly report? So I talked about debt and equity. You could have a third version, which is a hybrid of the two. So you could be paying a preferred 6% or something and then 25% upside. So you could combine these two and do a hybrid of debt and equity. And that's certainly normal to do that too. All of this is negotiable. I'm just, one end of the spectrum is debt, the other end is equity, and then you could create anything in between. So for you as the operator, you might look at it and say, what if I paid them 8% and 25 on the back end equity How's that pencil versus 50-50, no debt, no payments, no debt service, but 50-50? Like, you know, you're, you're always kind of running the numbers and it's gonna depend on the operator, it's gonna depend on the lender and what makes the most sense in that situation. Yeah, so there is no right or wrong. I do, I do all kinds of things in between all of that. But it's a great question because again, if the end game is to become a lender, how important is it to understand these different structures? It's super important. You wanna understand 
the different roles on the lending side. Now, what's great about being an operator first, lender second, which is me, is I've been on the receiving end so much, like borrowing the money, that I now know how to underwrite. I know all the different ways of structuring. Like I know their side of it because I'm so actively the borrower. So it's a natural progression. For me, it's not a natural progression to own assets because my world has been borrowing capital, flipping, paying it off. So it's a natural progression to go into the lending side. Okay, now who has an IRA? Wow, are you guys lending from your IRA? Raise your hand if you're lending from your IRA. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay, so the IRS has some issues around your IRA and how you use your IRA, don't they? Do they have some rules around what you can and can't do? Okay, if you do it wrong then, and they audit you, you're gonna be in big trouble. Because what an IRA does is the government says, we'll let you do tax deferred or tax free, depending on how you set up your IRA, we'll let you do that. But why is the IRS allowing you to have an IRA where you can earn tax-free or tax-deferred income? Why are they allowing that? What do they want you to do with that money? Invest it. Okay, why does the IRS only make me pay 4% tax and zero capital gains to live in Puerto Rico? Because it's a U.S. territory and they want people to come there and invest in the island to help the economy. Why does the IRS allow you to have depreciation right off? to own assets, to encourage investing, to provide affordable housing. These incentives are created because they want you to invest, at least, I don't know if the future they will because now you're the bad guy because you make money. But the idea here is to inspire you, motivate you, encourage you to invest. I saw a whole bunch of hands go up. You have an IRA. Did you know that you can self-direct it and then choose where you invest that money? Did everybody know that? The number one favorable way to invest in your IRA is to lend. They love lending from an IRA. Now, why would you think that they would love that? Well, let me ask you this. Could I set up an IRA, self-direct it, and then use that money to flip my own deals? Can I do that? I can't do that, why? Why will they not allow me to do that? It's my money. Self-interest, but what's the problem? What's the self-interest? Yeah, I'm a dealer now because I actively flip. I have an unfair advantage in the marketplace. So they're not gonna let me use my IRA tax-free or tax-deferred to flip houses. They're not gonna let you do that because now you're using it to make all this active income. How do they want you to use the IRA? Passive income, that's what they want you to do with it. They want you to invest it passively. If you're trying to invest it actively, then you throw up all these red flags and, and you're in the gray or in the no, no-go zone. But when you self-direct it and you lend it, that's very favorable. That's looked upon very well with the IRS. They like that. You can't use it to buy property you already own. You can't do spouse, parents, children, their spouses, grandparents, grandchildren, and their spouses. So you can't lend it that way because why? It's not arm's length. You have an unfair advantage if you're doing that as far as they're concerned. But you can self-direct your IRA and then you can lend it on real estate deals. If you guys aren't doing that and earning 8, 10, 12% interest on your money, you're totally missing the boat. And it's so easy to self-direct an IRA. You can go to somewhere like Equity Trust. They're out of Ohio. They're probably one of the biggest ones. It takes about two weeks. They'll move it over. And now you have control over where you lend that. There's a whole lot of strategies to use your IRA. But I would recommend everybody in this room, you need to self-direct that IRA and you need to start thinking about how you can lend it on deals and start your journey as a private money lender. So how do you get paid back? When do you pay yourself back? Remember, the IRA is its own entity. It's not you, it's the IRA that's doing the loan. And you can't take that money, it has to go back into the IRA. You can charge yourself a management fee, some people do that. But the idea here would be don't take the money, put it back in the IRA, grow the principal and compound interest that baby. I have a private money lender that's been with me now, I don't know, 15 years. And I think she's literally doubled or tripled her money because she keeps relending the principal. So I borrow it, pay her interest, principal grows, she relends that new principal. See the compound effect? It's massive, right? Like you'll double, triple your money in no time. One of the things I love about borrowing from IRA lenders is we defer payments. What does that mean, defer payments? The interest is accruing, but rather than making a monthly payment, 
you're letting it just accrue. And then when you pay off the loan, you pay back the principal and all of the accrued interest. Now, why is that beneficial to the operator and to the IRA lender? If I'm making a monthly payment, where's the money go? To the IRA, not to the IRA owner, but to the IRA. So now the custodian that's managing that money is gonna start charging fees. So it's gonna get expensive because they have to now manage that money coming. So I tell my IRA lenders, look, we're gonna defer the payments. We're gonna pay it all back. You can't touch it anyway. So it's not like you get that interest. It goes back to the IRA anyway. So everybody wins. I love it because now I'm not making monthly payments and it's all accruing. Think about it this way. Let's take a $100,000 PML and they lend me that money for six months. Well, if they re-lend with me on the second six months, then essentially I borrowed $200,000, right? Because I borrowed 100 twice over a year. I mean, not really, but it, to my, in my mind, I'm thinking about it that way. And what if I borrow that money again and again and again, next year, the year after, the year after, for the next 10 years? That $100,000 PML is worth millions to me because I'm gonna take that $100,000, I'm gonna do a deal and make, let's say 25,000 again, again, again. I'm leveraging their money for me to do deals, deals, deals. So the value of a PML as for the operator is tremendous. So the relationship is everything. I want them to have such a fantastic experience that they're signing up for the next deal. If they have a bad experience, they're not lending to you anymore. That's why even if I do a deal that loses, I always, always, always pay my PML. I do not ask them to participate. Why? Why would you not ask your lender to participate in a loss? They're out of there, man. They're gone. They're not going to lend you anymore. And I'd rather have them lending me again than whatever loss I took. Okay, that's just me. I value that relationship tremendously. Six steps to lending as a PML. This would be a debt lender and this would be like a fix and flip, which is pretty typical. Step one, you're gonna to wanna to do the underwriting. You're gonna look at a breakdown of the numbers. What's the purchase? What's the rehab? What's the after repair value? What's the exit? I wanna see comps that justify that after repair value. I wanna see the as is before pictures and I wanna know the closing date. So this is a breakdown of what I wanna see as the PML or what I would provide as an operator to a PML. Then we're gonna draft loan docs. I'm gonna put a promissory note together. That's gonna to have the terms, the conditions. We're gonna have a mortgage or a deed of trust. As the PML, you're gonna to wanna to see that. As an operator, I provide that to my lender. Let's look this over. Let's call and talk about it. Do you have any questions? Once it's reviewed and the PML says thumbs up, then the operator gets that signed and notarized. Then there's the closing. At the time of closing, the PML is gonna get a copy of the closing statement. They're gonna get wiring instructions. They're gonna get that mortgage. They're gonna get property and a lender policy on the insurance side. The PML is gonna wire the funds directly to title, not to the operator. Title is gonna record the mortgage or deed of trust with the county, and then the lender gets a recorded copy of that. Step four is if there's rehabs going on, is the operator's gonna put their money in first and then ask for PML to reimburse it. You don't write the operator a check for $40,000 and say, have a good rehab, because what might they do? Buy a boat instead, right? So they're put money in, then they get a draw. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you've seen a breakdown of what was done. You're gonna to wanna to see pictures of the work. Maybe you send somebody to verify it was done and then you're gonna send a draw. And then payments, if there's payments, then every month the operator is gonna pay that interest only payment typically to the PML and it's gonna be a, based on a prorated balance. So whatever you've drawn out so far. And then the payoff happens on the day of closing. Um, you're gonna get, uh, you're gonna provide a payoff letter to title because they're gonna see your lien recorded, then title pays you directly back from the proceeds. So these are the steps to doing your first PML. Decide what investment strategy you wanna lend on, make sure you're investing in the operator, understand the after repair value or the equity position, decide what loan to value you wanna be at, what equity position do you wanna have in the deal, determine what kind of return you wanna get for your money on, your, on the deal, and make sure you have a clear exit or turnaround time on that deal. Just in closing here, guys, this is a philosophy I have. All of this, we talk about money the whole time, right? Like how do we make money, how do we make money? But really at the end of the day, it's not about the money, it's about what? It's about having the time and the freedom to have, be, do, and give everything that matters in life. And I believe that God has big things in store for each of us. And I believe that our job, you know, the purpose of this life is to find that 
and live it at the highest capacity we can. And guys, all of you guys with, self, with IRAs, self-direct those IRAs, contact me and lend me your money on my deals because I'm very actively still doing deals. But honestly, guys, it was great to, to share this with you and I, I sure appreciate this time. And I'm sorry, Bill, for going over so much. All right, thank you, everybody. Do you mind taking a couple questions?